for those of you on the West Coast. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jarrett McPherson. I'm a Vice President Equity Research Analyst at Red Cloud Security. And today's guest is Orex Mineral, a silver explorer whose team have multiple successes in Mexico and around the world. And after quite a, peri after a quiet period, uh, are ready to get the San get back to work on the San Jacinto project uh, in Mexico. Today I have with me uh, on the webinar Ben Whiting, Vice President of Exploration at OR. And I'd like to thank Ben for joining us from Vancouver today. Well, thank you very much, Derek. The format of the webinar will be uh, Ben will introduce ORX Minerals and talk to talk to invest, you know, what investors have to look forward to, uh, and then we'll take questions live from the audience. To start with, uh, I'll handle I'll handle some of the disclosures, and then we'll get into it. For ORX Minerals, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two. Uh, of Orcs Mineral's corporate presentation located on the company website. For Red Cloud Securities Inc., I would highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note this not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investing. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Ben, and uh, you can Introduce introduce our, our, our audience to Orx Minerals. Uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to talk about Orx Minerals. Um, we're explorers and we have projects in Mexico and Canada. Mexico has been our main focus. Here's the cautionary statements. I'll make a few forward looking statements of what we're planning and uh, we'll move on from there. The Belcara Group is a management team um, that Oryx is a key member of, and we've had success in the past um, with the various discoveries, both in Oryx and in other companies, such as Orco Silver's La Preciosa discovery in Durango, Mexico. We understand that area of the central Mesa Central of Mexico for exploring for silver and gold very well because we've had success in that area and we've got a team to do it. The board of directors, as shown here, um, has a, that board has a lot of experience in exploring and financing uh, junior exploration projects. Also, as well as this team uh, in the head office, we have a team of consultants and an office in Durango, Mexico. So although we may be in a COVID-19 um, pandemic control situation right now, we have some very good people that are able to do work in Mexico on our behalf for Oryx Minerals. So the share structure is such that um, institutional investors have been a very key part of the story for Oryx. Ingalls and Snyder brokerage accounts, U.S. global investors, and others make up about half the, um, the shareholders. Fresneo Mining, which is the world's largest silver mining company, um, they have a 4% ownership in the company, and part of that was an investment in one of the projects that we have as a joint venture with Fresneo. Management, we have 25% of the stock of the company, so our interests are aligned with the shareholders, and there's a 21% um, retail float in the company. Current price is about a penny higher. It's uh, 10 and a half cents at the moment, and our cash position is larger than that because we've been uh, we've received some financing recently. I believe we're at about 1.7 million dollars. Um, there is a, an open financing right now that our friends at Red Cloud are certainly assisting us with. Um, there's a little note there that said, talks about a 2% NSR on the Barcelli Gold Deposit with Agnico Eagle. That's the project in Sweden, which was originally in Oryx, but we spun out the European assets separate from the Mexican assets a few years ago and Oryx still holds a 2% on a major gold discovery in northern Sweden. So Agnico Eagle is our joint venture partner there. The three projects that are in Oryx portfolio today are 
Sandra project, which is uh, previous name was Sandra Escobar. We're re reducing it to Sandra. And it's a joint venture with Pan American Silver. We've had we're, uh, projects with Pan American in the past, and they respect the team that we have to the point where we are the operators for the Sandra project. We also have the joint venture with Fresneo called Caneto, and it's in the town of Caneto de Comonfort in central uh, Mesa Central of, of Mexico. Another project that I'll mention towards the end is Jumping Josephine, and it's a gold copper project that 100% ownership um, of Jumping Josephine. It resides in the western Kootenays of southern British Columbia. Here's the Durango projects. It's a well-established mining history in Mexico. For a long time, uh, over 400 years, there have been silver and gold mines in the silver trend and the gold silver trend of Mexico. The silver trend has huge deposits, some of the largest in the world and some of the most profitable ones in the world. You can get a quick view of those going from Fresnillo in the state of Zacatecas, um, which is a billion ounce silver deposit plus. And that's where Mag Silver also has their Juana Scipio project. Um, La Colorada is Pan American Silver. Um, you can see La Paria, it's First Majestic. Um, La Preciosa, which is one of our discoveries, we sold that to, to Coor Mining, and they're advancing that project. Um, you can also see that uh, Guana Seve up in towards the northwest there, that's um, Endeavor Silver. So Sandra Escobar is not too far from Guanaceve. It's not too far from Pitaria, which I'll mention, Silver Standard, SSR Mining. It's the current name for uh, Silver Standard Mining. And the Caneto project is close to the producing El Castillo Mine, which is Argonaut. Just to give you a sense that we are in a mining friendly territory, we're also in an area where major silver and gold mines are in production. This one is, it has a new life on the project. Uh, we say that because the history of it here is we made a discovery. This hill, this gentle topography, and there's a green dot right near the center of the, of the project. That green dot is a diamond drilling rig. And you can see our environmental footprint is very minimal. We use man portable rigs. We move in uh, using ATV tracks that we build and then reclaim those ATV tracks and the drill pads as quickly as possible so that our mining, our environmental footprint is very minimal. On that hillside, as that photo is taken, there are over 65 drill holes, but it'd be hard to spot the individual drill pads because of the work that we've done. So Pan American Silver, are now a joint venture partner. They have bought out the interest of our previous partners, um, which is Canisil. And the new joint venture is a 60-40 joint venture with Pan American Silver holding 60, Oryx Minerals holding 40. We have a large land position, and Pan American put their claims in the same mining camp into this project as well. So we've expanded the size of the project um, by the inclusion of Pan Americans ground and we get interest in their ground, they get interest in ours. This is a general sort of layout of the deposit. Um, the Bolaris deposit is on the fringes of a uh, collapsed caldera system that it was mineralized. So a large system and we have a large um, claim position. Within here, this is where the Bolaris deposit is. I'll mention that as a peripheral uh, or a distal deposit be a lower temperature silver. There's also a small artisanal mine called San Francisco mine. And the San Francisco is uh, a mine that's working on sulfides. And it's a little closer to where we think the heat source will be. And a lot of the areas up in this area were where Pan American um, which had their claims and where they're going to be doing their work. So. so This just gives you a sense for the Bolaris deposit. We made a discovery. You can see the very first drill hole was 61 meters or 43 meters true thickness 
of 359 grams of silver per ton. And that's right at surface. It's a flat-lying uh, horizontal deposit in a crystallithic tooth. Um, this made a run on the stock to push it up quite high, but then we did some metallurgical tests and found that a portion of it was refractory. So I'll put that out right away. Pan American will be looking at the metallurgical issues here, but that is not the only part of the story. The Bolaris deposit I see as being this low temperature distal part of a much bigger system. It tells us that there's silver in this mining cap. The first resource estimate was put out in 2016 and um, it comes in at about 33 uh, million ounces of silver. This is a couple of cross sections. We talk about the Bolaris deposit. We solve the metallurgical issues on it, uh, that it would be a, an open pit situation as a thick horizontal um, bed of disseminated silver mineralization. And within that horizontal bed, there are some higher grade stock work uh, zones. And it, the feeder system was probably lateral to this. Okay. Here are some examples of the Sandra Escobar mineralization. You can see that a lot of the samples don't look terribly exciting when they're still pretty good grades, the upper left and the lower right. There, there's 254 grams per ton silver in what looks like a piece of concrete. That's a, a crystal lithic too for rhyolite. And the places where you do get more of the veining, little stock works that develop, you can get kilogram values of silver. The illustration in the lower left is 1.245 kilograms of silver per ton. So very high grade. You do get a mixture of the two in this deposit. Where the top picture is on this image is the Sandra property extends beyond the red hill in the center of the project. And that's the direction that it seems the mineralogically uh, indicated signatures for the deposit are showing that there's a temperature increase in that direction. In the foreground where the truck is parked is the burrow zone of the Bolaris deposit and the Bolaris deposit would be most of what you see in this foreground. So as we continue for the next phases of exploration will be to tie in the geology and the lithogeochemistry and the geophysics of the two projects that have historically been on the project on, on this area and make the Sandra project a single unit of study for the whole of the mining camp. The little artisanal mine that's in the lower left, you can see it. they were cutting into the hillside there and they have a small shaft that goes down. They were uh, mining sulfides and shipping it uh, over to Torreon, which is where there's a smelter. They were putting it into sacks and trucking it all the way to Torreon with no mill. So it gives you a sense that there are some high grade zones in this mining camp. Okay. Now we'll move over a little further to the southeast. Conetto Silver Gold Project is in a village that's called Conetto de Common Fort, and it's actually a little older than the city of Durango itself. We're in Durango State. Uh, over 450 years ago, the conquistadors came through here, and one of the conquistadors was Coronado, and Coronado wintered in this region, uh, before he headed further north all the way up into New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, but that's where the mining history was with these conquistadors. Uh, it's the first recorded mining history in the area. Veins stick out in this camp as a, a window into the lower volcanic succession. There's a major vol volcanism in Mexico. And you can see a vein that's outcropping right on the hillside here. And there's another parallel vein that comes down the hillside on this illustration. Those are examples of veins on a property where there are over 50 veins um, to explore on this project. The joint venture partners are Fresneo Mining PLC, 
and Fresneo over the past couple of years have been the operator. We're in discussions as to how to move this project forward. We're at 45% ownership on a significant land package. You can see 4,800 hectares in this camp as well. And so that's um, the kind of, that's 48 square kilometers on the property. Um, the property in the Mesa Central gives us easy access. There's power line corridors, there's road access. We don't have to build a town. There's water sources. Everything that you would want to have a mining operation in an area of Mexico run smoothly would be in a location like this. Fresneo has spent over six million on the property to earn their 55%. And um, I'd certainly want to see Caneto moving forward to the next step. Give you a sense for what the drilling looks like on Caneto. Different veins here that it is a, a gold silver system, but there are also base metal credits which could be incorporated into a future resource. In the past, mining operations have taken place in this camp, and the mining operations uh, recovered lead, zinc, silver, copper, and gold. Give you an example, though, of Santo Nino. Santo Nino hole here is 3.3 uh, meters, 2.7 true thickness of four over four grams of gold, 612 grams of silver. But there are no holes within a couple of hundred meters of that drill hole. So there are other places on that, on the property that we know that there is silver where there is gold, but we have not yet explored it all. There are veins towards the north of San Nino and uh, La Bufa that have no drill holes. That haven't, we haven't reached those yet because there are so many targets still on the property. This is what the material looks like when you're in the top part of the, of the vein systems. You tend to get surface oxidation. And I have put some gold and silver values onto the samples of the drill core. And it gives you a sense for what the textures look like and the alteration. This would be an andesite hosted classic intermediate sulfidation silver gold system that is typical of uh, mining camps in Mexico. If you get down a little deeper, this is sulfide mineralization, and it has the textures that show boiling conditions uh, took place in these vein systems, and that they are polyphase vein systems introducing mineralization on top of mineralization. Some of the samples can be quite significant. Here, you've got almost 5,000 grams per ton silver, uh, along with base metal credits. So you have Argentite is the major silver bearing mineral um, with some calico pyrite in this sample, some galena, uh, which is the silvery looking minerals. The argentite tends to be a blackish gray mineral. And you've got sphalerite, which is the brownish color uh, mineral that's in the sample. There's a little bit of pyrite in the sample as well. So those textures, some of the uh, void spaces tell you a lot about the conditions of where this was formed. Uh, lastly, of the projects is Jumping Josephine. It's a gold project that we own 100% of it, the large land package over 11,000 hectares, so 112 square kilometers, and it's in the West Kootenai region near Castlegar. It has a National Instrument 43101 uh, resource estimate um, that has been written on, the, on this project. We're currently in negotiations with a company that are looking to acquire gold and silver assets in this part of British Columbia. And so we may be announcing uh, a deal on that fairly soon. It gives you a sense for what the company has been, been doing. Uh, three projects, two strong mining jurisdictions. Uh, joint venture partners, two of the major silver producers that Pan American is the number two silver producer in the world, and Fresneo is the number one silver producer in the world. So we do have partnerships with people who can take it to the next step. Established presence in Durango State, we've explored there before. We've got an office in the city of Durango, and we've got a Mexican team that works with us in Durango. We have a strong technical team. Um, 
to evaluate new projects as well as advance the projects that we currently have. And we deliver results. There are people, shareholders who have made money with us before. And I say right now, there is more to be discovered. Thank you very much. Great, Ben. That's a great, uh, a great overview. Um, maybe digging back, start by digging into your main project, uh, Sandra. Um, in our discussions, you've compared it to 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 another asset. Um, maybe explain a little bit about that uh, um, that other you know operating asset, and then why you think the there's a good comparison there, and then you know what you think the potential is at uh, Sandra relatively. You're referring to uh, La Pitaria for SSR mining. And La Pitaria is about 75 kilometers to the um, east of Sandra Project. Uh, it's not just me who have looked at that and said this looks alike, but their exploration manager for SSR mining and their graduate student who did her PhD on the project. Um, so that would be Claire Summers. Um, she also said this looks like an analog for La Pitaria. Um, what I see is the area that we've been spending the most time in the, in 2016, 2017 was the Boleros discovery. And it is a lookalike to an area called, um, Cordon, Colorado. It's a distal part of La Pitaria. They have the same flat lying, uh, crystal lithic tubes that are porous that have fluids flowing laterally. They have manganese oxides and hydroxides. They have some native silver in there. They have potassic alteration. They have all the signatures that are very similar between the two spots. As you move away from Cordon, Colorado, you get to an area called Breccia Ridge, which is the heart of La Pitaria. What we're thinking now is that as you get away from Belarus, you head towards the uh, the big red hill that you saw in the photograph. So the Cerro Colorado, that area of Sandra Project is the equivalent of Breccia Ridge, but it hasn't been tested to the same extent. And so the, the opportunity for discovery and the mineral, mineralogical changes that we see are very compelling for this project. Right, and that's a that's a good example. It's one of the things I, I often say that when you're uh, looking at your looking for an exploration project, you should there should be something like it in production somewhere else. And, and so uh, this does that good comparison uh, in that case. Um, I guess with respect to um, I, question from from the line with respect to the 2020 exploration budget. I guess what's the for you guys, what's the plan uh, for spending at Sandra? And then is there a plan for spending at, uh, at Canetto this year as well? It, it'll be Sandra first. Um, we're not certain about the startup time, but it'll probably be in the next month that we'll have our geologists going in there um, to do ground work, to tie in the geological maps, to give us a common platform for the two because they had the Pan American ground and, uh, and our ground and bring the two of those together. So there'll be the surface sampling, there'll be uh, the, the geophysics and there'll be the geology first. And then we will prioritize together with the uh, exploration team of Pan American to decide where we're going to drill. And I would expect drilling to be happening um, this fall. As for um, Conetto, we're still in discussions. Um, Prisneo is a big company. So the timing of when we, we can make a decision on that project, uh, um, we're, we're coming up with some, some concepts of what we would like to do. And we'll see about, uh, the approval because it's a 55-45, uh, joint venture and they would have to improve their, um, uh, budget as well. So we may, also suggest that perhaps it would fit in with a different mining company and that we may make an offer of some some way to bring in a different partner uh, on that project but that's still a forward-looking statement that is very much it's uh it's looking at a future opportunities it's a valuable asset it's a valuable project uh, we just don't want it to sit there as being inventory for fresneo 
and I, and and they've spent uh, uh, ben, ben, how much have they spent over the years on the project to earn that fifty five percent interest? Uh, they spent over six million dollars on the project so far. Right, um, and so that's uh, uh, you know obviously they've ha they've had a good a good a good look at it, and just um, maybe for those for those on the line, it's probably an important point. Um, the JV structure for Sandra and Canetto, if I remember correctly, those are both true JVs in the sense that um, shared expenses, there's no earnings or anything like that left to do. So Oryx contributes and then the partners contribute to it for any work that's done. That is absolutely correct, yes. Okay. Um, and then, now, just to take a, a little bit of a step back, um, I, I've known, uh, the, uh, yourself and the team for for several years now, uh, but maybe um, can you give a, on the the Bella Care Group and what the advantages are uh, being in that group and, and what that means for shareholders of Orex or some of the other companies uh, that are there. Okay, or Orex currently there are three companies active uh, um, in the Bella Care Group. Um, there's Barcelle Minerals, which is in Sweden which used to be part of Orex. And so many shareholders in Orex are also shareholders in, uh, in Barcelo. Um, but it does give us access to a larger qualified uh, technical experts um, in exploration that you don't find in a lot of junior mining companies. So it's more of a team expert with, uh, with Art Freeze um, being a, a very seasoned, uh, successful explorationist with uh, Kaminko and with Gold Corp in the past. And we do have uh, um, Dale Britliff, who's a geologist, and he's worked on the Sandra project in the past as well. When we made the Valeris discovery, uh, he's been involved in a variety of other projects and a uh, very talented fellow. Um, Rob Van Egmont is uh, an affiliate of the um, Belcara Group as well. He's currently on the Dolly Varden project, which we had for three years in the um, in our group for exploration. In the Belcara Group, we managed uh, Dolly Varden to sort out the geological complexity of their mining camp, and then turned it over to the new managers of that project. Um, so you can see that our connections, both from uh, the geological team that we have in-house, but also the consultants and the other people that come in for specialty tasks, such as Blue Coast Research. Um, they come in for advisories. We have structural geologists that come in and advisories. We have those in place in our um, junior companies. It's a, it, it's a significant advantage, and I've, uh, I've had the privilege of being in your offices and sort of listening to you guys' bad ideas around it is it is good. Um, all shareholders are benefiting from that. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, obviously Oryx holds a 2% NSR on, on Barcelli, uh, a project you guys are very familiar with. Um, maybe a, a quick update on that project and, you know, what that, uh, how that 2% NSR is uh, creating value for Oryx shareholders right now. Yes, um, Barcelli is in the Schlefte trend of northern Sweden. That's the same uh, trend that has volcanogenic massive sulfides and uh, uh, orogenic gold deposits, um, where Boliden got their start, the big mining, Swedish mining company got their start. Landin Mining, which is a major company, got their start in the Schlefte trend. We're in that same trend. Um, we have a gold deposit that is currently um, in a, an area where they've evaluated it for three kilometers along the strike of the major shear zones with multiple loads. We don't know where the bottom of it is, but the resource was done in the top 450 meters. We have drill holes that go down over a kilometer and we're hitting gold in those drill holes as well. The structures that we've mapped out and in areas that we haven't tied into the uh, zone, a place called Risperget, means it eight kilometers along that strike of the gold trend. The property there for Orex shareholders is that we have a 2% net smelter return on that whole project of, of uh, Barcelle, including any new discoveries that are made to the north in the volcanogenic massive sulfides. 
There is one massive sulfide uh, deposit called Nora that's on the property as well. So we do have both types and that's a value at some point in Oryx. It's, it's something that we're, we're considering what we're going to do with it today. Right. At the current market cap, certainly something that almost backstops the value um, on its own. Yeah. Uh, the, and I guess um, maybe to uh, uh, wrap it, or not to wrap it up, but to focus back on Sandra. Um, with the, uh, obviously, you're starting with uh, field work uh, and news flow, uh, what, are, what are the steps to get back into the field for you guys, and how are you managing uh, uh, COVID, as I'm assuming is what's the hold up to get, uh, get part of the hold up to get back to work? Um, it has been. Mexico did have a, a moratorium on exploration in some areas. Um, Durango has a relatively low uh, COVID um, profile, so it doesn't have as many cases or the expansion of cases that Mexico City does or that the Gulf Coast has, such as Veracruz. Durango and Chihuahua to the north are two of the lower areas as far as the COVID-19 um, positive cases go. Um, what we are finding is that it's starting to open up that you're allowed to go into areas to start exploration. What we will do is we will lease a house that will be for our workers there so they'll be able to go to their work sites and then go back to the house and not have as much contact uh, with other people during these, these uh, very trying times. Um, we have to take these issues seriously. We have protocols as far as um, how a lot of contractors would work and uh, what the diamond drillers would, would be doing as well. Um, and we have discussions with the diamond drilling companies as to what their um, COVID-19 procedures are for it. But it, we will be able to advance the projects. Yeah, I, I think that's the important part. And we've seen exploration start to uh, start to open back up. Uh, as well, and I guess having uh, Pan American as a partner who have infrastructure there as well uh, doesn't hurt the the, the process. Um, okay, and then one of the things that we've we you you and I've talked about and we've talked about is on 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 the uh, Polaris deposit and that additional metallurgy. Um, what is obviously Pan American now that they've sort of now that the structure's been consolidated and they have extensive operating experience what are they looking at with uh, uh what are they hoping to accomplish with maybe some new met testing at Bolaris? yeah they'll they'll probably come in and take a bulk sample is the most likely um steve busby is their chief operating officer and uh steve is is comes from the operation side of things and he really wants to sink his teeth into that deposit he sees it right sitting there on surface with a less than one-to-one -one stripping ratio, and it's just this slab with silver in it. So he said, yeah, give me a chance on that. Um, I'm a geologist by background. I understand a lot of uh, metallurgy, but it's not my specialty. So I'll leave it in the hands of the, the specialist as to whether you want to do an acid bath to start with and then a cyanide leach afterward or what other types of methods would be used to extract the silver, but I, I'm still very hopeful that they'll make progress on that front as well. Uh, the, as a metallurgist, I could tell you everything is recoverable. It's all about economics. The advantage Bolaris has going forward is that it's got grade, and then, as you mentioned, it's a one-to-one -one strip ratio laying its surface. So um, it, those are those are things that make it a little bit easier to spend some more money on the processing and still generate good economics. Um, I think with that. Um, uh, I think we're uh, out of questions from from the line, so I think we'll we'll leave it here. But on uh, maybe just uh, Ben before we go, just remind us again uh, what people should expect uh, from Orx Newsflow wise with respect to, uh, to to Sandra and when you guys expect to get drilling. Way I see it is the first thing will be completion of the financings that are underway right now. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Red Cloud and your team. Uh, for being a part of that financing. And then there will be the uh, start of the field work and the surface and lithogeochemical uh, testing. Um, I expect that it will be in the third quarter that we will start a diamond drilling program. So those are the general steps that happen. Uh, between then and now, there may be some others because we're also uh, receiving 
um, some property submissions. We receive information from a variety of different uh, sources as to what would be best for our company. And so the negotiations are ongoing. Okay. That sounds, uh, that sounds good. I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. I'd like to thank uh, Ben Whiting of Oryx Minerals for taking the time to present today. I'd also like to thank everyone on the line for uh, uh, being here today and then and managing through the, the slight technical issue with having to re re-register uh, late in the day. Um, and just as a reminder for everybody, uh, our next webinar is, uh, there we have lots this week. We have 2 p.m. tomorrow with uh, another Silver Explorer Brixton Metals, following up that on Wednesday with a, a company that used to produce a lot of silver and still does, uh, Agnico Eagle, um, produces a little bit of gold too, uh, at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. And then a uh, Australian gold gold producer, uh, Corolla Resources Formula RNC, Thursday at 2 p.m. So uh, if you are available uh, in the mid afternoon of this week, we've got something for you to, to, to watch. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, and uh, have a pleasant day. Thank you very much. Thanks.